Kate McClellan, pro wedding planner with over 16 years of experience helping more than 400 couples down the aisle. I started Planning Collective to help all couples get through the overwhelm of wedding planning by sharing my actionable tips and tools that I've used over the years working with my clients. We'll focus on getting rid of what I like to call FOWO, the fear of wedding oversight. This is an unfortunate condition that almost every couple will suffer from at some point. Let's get you back to enjoying the planning process. Here we go. Hey guys, Kate here. Welcome back to another episode of the Wedding Planning Collective podcast. In today's episode, I'm going to chat about 15 commonly missed budget items. Now, if you've been listening to past episodes of the podcast, specifically those talking about the budget, I've encouraged you to have a miscellaneous category within your budget. These costs should make up about 5 to 10% of your overall budget. Typically, the lower end would be for couples that are in more traditional, all-inclusive type venues. The higher end, if you are doing a backyard wedding or if you are in a unique venue where these unexpected costs tend to pop up more frequently. These 15 items that we're going to go through today often end up falling in that miscellaneous budget item, but if you have it planned ahead of time, you might find yourself with some extra cash in that miscellaneous fund. And that is never a bad thing. All right, let's get into it. Number one, alterations. This seems like a small budget item, but it can really add up depending on the style and fabric of the attire you choose. Whether it's a wedding gown, tux, or a suit, they can be pretty expensive to alter depending on what needs to be done. You may luck out and not have to have this expense, but some couples will spend several hundred dollars on this, so you want to make sure that you have something set aside for alterations. Number two, taxes and service fees at your venue or catering company. As we've talked about in past episodes, this can be up to a 30% addition to your budget for your catering and food costs, so it's definitely a category that you do not want to miss. Make sure you look at the fine print and see if there are any required service or operational fees included in your cost. Number three, vendor meals and gratuities. Any of your vendors that are going to be on site with you through the majority of the day, but especially during dinner service, are going to need to have some kind of dinner provided for them. Often your venue or catering company will have a discounted price. You're definitely not going to be paying for bar and appetizers and all of those extras, but you do want to make sure that you're offering your vendors some kind of meal so that they can provide you with their best service. You definitely don't want a hangry photographer or planner for that matter. Now, gratuities is a little bit different. Some vendors are going to have required gratuities, like we just talked about in number two. Those service fees are often considered a gratuity for your caterer or venue staff. Other vendors, like your beauty team, hair and makeup stylists, and transportation companies, will commonly have a required gratuity also written into their contract. Hair and makeup would be similar to if you were going to a salon, and transportation would just depend on what services you book. Gratuities for other vendors are usually up to you, though, and not a requirement by any means. I talk about this in more detail in episode 19, so make sure you check that out. Number four is accommodations. Now, hotel blocks are often on couples' lists, but don't forget that you're most likely going to need accommodations for at least two nights for the two of you. If you're planning on using your hotel room for hair and makeup or any activities the morning of the wedding, you'll most likely need to reserve it the evening before. If we're talking about suites in hotels, that can be pretty pricey, so make sure you have that written into your budget. Number five, speaking of activities in the morning, don't forget that you need to feed yourself and wedding party prior to the reception. An example of this for our brides that are having hair and makeup done, typically they'll have the bridesmaids all gather in either the bridal suite or another room at the hotel, and you'll want to make sure you have breakfast and or lunch for everybody that is there. This can be a deli tray or something simple that you pick up from Costco, but some hotels will require that you use their room service or catering department, and that's where things can get a little pricey. Either way, don't forget you do need to eat before that expensive meal at the reception. Number six, postage for your wedding invitations. 
Depending on your guest count, this can be a small or huge expense. The one piece a lot of couples don't think about, even if they do have stamps on their list, is that you also need to include a stamp on the RSVP return envelope. So basically, you're doubling your postage at least, depending on the cost of the postage for your invite. Also keep in mind that it is common for wedding invitations to be more expensive than mailing a regular letter. If you're doing something in a unique shape or if you have multiple card inserts, make sure you take it to the post office before purchasing your stamps so that you know you're buying the right amount. And number seven on our commonly missed budget item list is additional hours that you may need for vendors or your venue. When you're first booking with your venue or your vendors, it's super common to not have a great handle on what your timeline is going to be. Well, that's absolutely fine. There's no way that you can know those details so far in advance. You want to budget for the possibility that you may need to add additional hours to photographers, DJs, or maybe even your bar service. Moving on to number eight, setup and teardown fees. This is one category that if you are in a unique space or a backyard wedding, you're going to want to have a healthy amount set aside for this. While you're looking at your rental orders, make sure to look and see if it includes setup and teardown costs. It's not unusual for a rental company to deliver 200 chairs and just leave them stacked in your yard. If you want to pay for them to set up the tables and chairs, there's typically an extra cost for that. On the flip side, if they show up to pack up after the wedding and the tables and chairs are still where they were for the reception, they're often going to charge you a teardown fee because they need to restack the chairs and tables. If you plan on having them add these fees in ahead of time, it usually costs less than if they show up and have to add them in after the fact. Number nine, wedding day accessories and undergarments, as well as additional outfits for things like your rehearsal, post-wedding brunch, and even your showers. A lot of brides will have a certain amount designated in their budget for their wedding gown. Let's say in your budget that your wedding day attire is broken down to $1,500. If you go into a bridal shop and say that $1,500 is your budget for your gown, you're most likely already going to be over budget unless you don't plan on wearing a veil, shoes, jewelry, or anything like that. So if you have a very strict budget, you'll want to look for a gown that is under that amount so that you still have room for those other accessories. Number 10, beauty appointments. Almost every budget has a line item for hair and makeup on the day of the wedding, but most brides will also include other appointments like getting your nails done, maybe some added hair or eyelash extensions, those teeth whitening appointments, all of that adds up. So if you are planning on doing any of those things, make sure that you have some wiggle room in your budget for that. Number 11 is our wedding party and parent gifts. It's pretty straightforward. Most couples will give some kind of thank you to their wedding party and parents as a part of the wedding planning process. But one thing to keep in mind that has become a very popular trend the last few years is if you plan on doing some kind of proposal to your wedding party, make sure to budget for that as well. Of course, it is not necessary or it can be something as simple as a written card, but I have seen some very elaborate bridesmaid proposals online and they can definitely get expensive. Number 12 is another one that is probably geared more towards those that are doing a unique venue or a backyard wedding, but you want to take into consideration that you might have some added costs for lighting and sound. Even if you're in a more traditional venue, if you're having the ceremony on site, there might be a cost to add in a mic stand or use their sound system for a ceremony. If you're outside, make sure that you have the conversation with the venue or the homeowners about lighting for not just the tent, but anywhere where guests are going to be walking around. You'll want to consider how dark it's going to get at the end of the evening as guests are walking to their car. And if you have an added restroom trailer, make sure that it is properly lit. Moving on to number 13, day of wedding stationery. Similar to our breakdown for wedding attire, it's common for couples to look at their stationery budget and consider that to be for invitations. Well, there's no doubt that that is going to take up the largest portion of your stationery budget, 
Don't forget that you're most likely going to need other things like at least place cards or a seating chart. And a lot of couples will also want to have programs, menu cards, and various signage throughout the reception. And number 14 is for our brave couples that want to have an outdoor wedding. We're tying this into the budget because if it does rain or if the weather doesn't allow for you to have your first choice, where are you going to have the ceremony as a backup? It may be a simple, no added cost solution, like moving everybody under the tent or into the reception space. But in some situations, you may need to have a backup tent on hold for your ceremony or have a room inside the venue ready just in case you need to move things inside. And number 15 definitely hits close to home for me, having a day of coordinator. I'm recording this in the beginning of April, and for us, we are gearing up for wedding season here in Michigan. In the spring, I always get a slew of requests from couples looking for somebody to be their day of coordinator for the summer wedding. It's not uncommon as the day gets closer to realize exactly what is going to have to be done on the day and acknowledging that you don't want to have your wedding party or your parents working the wedding for you. So if you're not already working with a wedding planner and you have room in your budget, you definitely want to have a day of coordinator available to help you throughout the wedding day. Now, that title is super awful and deceiving. No one can simply show up on the day and know exactly how to coordinate everything. So for more information on what exactly a day of coordinator is, make sure to check out episode 26. And there you have it, 15 commonly missed budget items. Hopefully you have some room in your budget for all of these items, or you have a healthy miscellaneous fund set aside for any of these things that might pop up. If you're looking for more tips on planning your wedding, head on over to the Wedding Planning Collective Facebook group, where I'll be going live and sharing more tools and tricks for you as you're planning your wedding. And if you found this episode helpful, I would love it if you could give me a quick review and share it with other engaged couples. Sharing links to episodes that help answer questions posted in wedding planning Facebook groups is another great way to help, and any support is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you in the next episode.